Okay, so we could start and we'll start with three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. Let me just open. Get some more light. Okay, and then we do, we could do just one time the salutation to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Okay, good morning, everybody. And we are now going back and we're still going to spend a little more time on the sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Fives, number 23, and look at a few related suttas. And last time, you see the sutta begins by speaking about five defilements of gold, and then it compares those to the five hindrances. So the five hindrances are called the five defilements of the mind, because of which the mind is not malleable, wieldy, and luminous, but brittle and not properly concentrated for the destruction of the asavas. And then we have the five hindrances, sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse and doubt, and last time I went through the five hindrances individually and spoke about the particular antidotes or ways of counteracting the five hindrances mentioned in the suttas. And there was one other method that I didn't come to last week. And this is a method laid out in the Satipatthana Sutta it comes in the section, the fourth foundation of mindfulness, the Dhammanupassana, the contemplation of Dhammas or phenomena. And so the text speaks about the monk dwells contemplating Dhammas as Dhammas in terms of the five hindrances. And this is the method. So you see, the Satipatthana method, it doesn't presuppose that one has already overcome the five hindrances in order to begin, but it speaks about how in the process of contemplation, there can arise first, sensual desire might arise. So in that case, the monk or the practitioner knows there is sensual desire in me. And when there's no sensual desire, he knows there is no sensual desire in me. And so you see, even turning the, you could take the hindrances when they arise and turn them into objects of knowledge. And by turning them into objects of knowledge, they cease obsessing the mind and they become just means for understanding how the mind works. It's a way of getting acquainted with the working, the functioning of one's mind. And so this applies to sensual desire. It's elaborated by way of sensual desire, but apply, it, uh, the same method applies to each of the other hindrances. When there is ill will, this anger, irritation, annoyance, even hatred, one knows there is ill will in me with sloth and torpor or dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, doubt. When any of those hindrances arise, one knows the hindrance is present in me. And in that way, again, one turns the hindrance. Usually when the hindrance, when we're not using the method of mindful contemplation, the hindrance is working in the background of the mind and sort of controlling, pulling the strings on how the mind works so that we flow along in the grip of sensual desire or ill will, or we become dull and drowsy or restlessness and anxious or overcome, beset by doubt. But when we 
turn the hindrance into an object of knowledge, put it in the foreground, then it is a sort of kind of subject of investigation. And so it stops controlling us from behind, but we are in charge observing the hindrance in front of us. And as we do so, what usually happens, or one of the things that happen is that the hindrance gets weaker and falls away. And when it falls away, then you know that now there is no central desire in me, no ill will and so on, no doubt in me. And then further, one sort of investigates further in order to understand how the unarisen hindrance arises. What are the triggers or the conditions that cause the hindrance to arise? And one comes to understand how the hindrance is abandoned. What are the particular strategies that one can use to cause the arisen hindrance to become weaker and to fall away? And then one comes to understand what are the particular methods or strategies that one can use to prevent that abandoned hindrance from arising again in the future. And of course, the ultimate antidote to all of the five hindrances to cut them off entirely is wisdom, the wisdom of insight that sees into their impermanent and empty selfless nature. And then what is called the wisdom of the world transcending paths that cuts off the subtle seeds or the roots out of which the hindrances arise. And so this is the application or the use of the Satipatthana method, the method of mindful contemplation rather than the method of focused concentration as a way of overcoming and removing the five hindrances. Okay, then if we go back now to our the basic sutta that we've been uh, studying, sutta number 23, we see that the text speaks about the mind freed from the five hindrances or five defilements, becoming malleable, wieldy, luminous, and properly concentrated for the destruction of the taints. Then it says rather cryptically, when there is a suitable basis, one is capable of realizing any state realizable by direct knowledge towards which one might incline the mind. And then it goes on to say, if one wishes to exercise the various kinds of psychic powers, one can do so. So usually we have just one body, but if you have this power, psychic power, you can just make the determination, may I have many bodies, and lo and behold, maybe your friends in California are putting out the welcome mat and saying, wow, I didn't expect you here. Wow, come in, sit down and have some tea. But meanwhile, you're chatting with your friends in New York State. <laughs> and <laughs> then when those two groups of friends get together and they say, he was in California, we were quite surprised to see him. Wait a minute. We were chatting with him in New York and we never heard, or the same day, same time, we never heard about him making a trip to California. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we get to the other psychic powers, what has to be added is that if you just look at the sutta the way it's stated here, it seems that what you just do is overcome the five hindrances and then immediately, without any further steps, you gain the psychic powers and the other types of super, supernormal knowledges.
but actually this is not the case at all. But to, because we know from other suttas that to exercise the super knowledges after abandoning the five hindrances, you have to go on to gain the at least the four jhanas and particularly to master the fourth jhana. That is based upon the suttas. But the Visuddhi Magga, the path, so called path of purification, the great treatise on Theravadan meditation, mentions still further preliminary, preliminary steps to gaining the super knowledges, especially the psychic types of psychic powers. So it says that what you have to do is to master the four jhanas based on the different kasinas. Well, not only the four jhanas, but one also has to master the four formless meditations, the base of infinite space, base of infinite consciousness, base of nothingness, base of neither perception nor non-perception. Then you have to master each of the jhanas based on, I think, eight kasinas. That is the four element kasinas, the earth kasina, water kasina, fire kasina, and wind kasina. Then the color kasinas, the blue kasina, red kasina, yellow kasina, white kasina. And then one has to go through various kinds of call these maybe mental acrobatics, sort of connecting the jhanas, each jhana with each of the kasinas, then each kasina with each of the jhanas, with each jhana with each of the kasinas, then each kasina with each of the jhanas, and then one has to be able to go into the jhana, out of the jhana with each of the kasinas very quickly. And so the mind becomes extremely flexible, extremely malleable and wieldy. And then one has to master what are called the four idipadas, the four bases for psychic power. The four idipadas are the basis for psychic power involving a desire or the will, volition. Then the basis for psychic power involving energy. Then the basics, basis for psychic power involving the mind, the purity of the mind. Then the basis for psychic power involving investigation. And then when you go through the four bases for psychic power, then one has the capacity for exercising these psychic powers. So you, this is the commentarial method. You have to master the eight, the four jhanas and four formless attainments, then be able to develop skills, acrobatic skills with those jhanas regarding the eight kasinas. And then one has to master the four bases or roads to psychic power. And so all of those are very, very difficult achievements. It's not the case that you just overcome the five hindrances and then you develop these psychic powers. Okay, so let us now, we could take a look at these psychic powers or modes of direct knowledge. <clears throat> So the first of these are called, excuse me, <clears throat> the types of psychic potency. This is iddi, corresponds in Sanskrit riddhi, and is closely related to the Sanskrit word siddhi. Okay, so we have, I think there are eight. So having been one, that's our normal condition, having one body, just through an act of will, one could multiply one's body so that you could appear in many places at the same time. 
And then again, through another act of will, you could bring all of those multiple bodies together back into one's own natural body. Then one can appear and vanish. So at will, when you could disappear, you become the invisible man or woman. And then again, through an act of will, you reappear. Okay, then you can move unhindered through a wall, through a rampart, through a mountain, without getting stuck as though it were just moving through empty space. You could dive in and out of the earth as though it were water. You can walk on water without sinking. Sitting cross-legged, you can travel through the sky like a bird. And with your hand, you can touch the moon and sun so powerful and mighty. And you can exercise mastery with the body as far as the Brahma world. So one is capable of these different psychic powers when there is a suitable basis. That is the key expression. And the suitable basis, according to the Sutta method, would be simply mastering to a very, very high degree of, of dexterity, mastering the fourth jhana. And if you follow, go by the commentarial method, as I explained, is mastering the eight attainments and then mastering those attainments with regard to the eight casina objects and then fully developing the four roads to psychic power. Okay, maybe the question comes to mind whether these psychic powers, are they taken to be literal or are they just figurative expressions? I think against the background of ancient Indian spirituality, or even against the background of maybe modern Indian spiritual traditions, they're to be taken quite literally. Um, there is a book that had been quite popular, maybe it still is, but quite popular back in the 1960s, 1970s. Maybe some of you have read it called Autobiography of a Yogi by one of the first yoga masters, so Hindu spiritual masters to teach in North America, Paramahansa Yogananda. So this is his autobiography, the autobiography of a yogi, in which he relates his early years of spiritual quest when he was on his spiritual quest as a young man in, you know, in northern India. And he actually encountered yogis who had the ability to be in two places at one time. And I heard about this also from the great South Indian master of the coming out of the Vedantic tradition, Ramana Mahashi who is said to have been in several places at the same time. And yeah, so it seems to me quite feasible to those who have gained very deep mastery over samadhi. And another thing that Paramahansa, Yoga, Paramahansa Yogananda witnessed, there was a yogi that he called the levitating saint who was able to rise up into the air. Yeah, I heard that the system called Transcendental Meditation TM, taught by, what's his name, Mahashi Mahesh Yogi, is that what he was called, would teach levitation. But what I think, I, what I heard what his levitation involves is yet you sit cross legged and then you, through your skill in yoga, you're able to sort of physically call the bot to cause the body to bounce from place to place. But that's quite different from real levitation, from rising up into the air and moving through the air. Yeah, I sometimes say that 
of these two of these eight psychic powers, I myself have personal experience of two of them. Yeah, one of them is walking on water without sinking, which I've done at the uh, on the lake here in the middle of Zhuangyan Monastery, usually in middle or late January when the lake freezes over and becomes solid ice. And it's still H2O, so you could say it's still water and I could walk across it without falling in. And then the other is sitting cross-legged and traveling through the sky, particularly with jet blue, I think it is, which has quite ample leg room. So if I'm a jet blue flight, then I, then I can cross my legs if there's, yeah. If nobody is sitting on the middle seat, then I could cross my legs and fly through the sky like a bird. Okay, so those are the psychic kinds of psychic power. So if you don't find feel comfortable with the literal explanation, then you can take them figuratively. But I think in against the background of the Buddha's time, the Buddha quite uh, did intend them to be taken quite literally. Okay, then if one wishes using the divine ear, which is purified and surpasses the human, you can hear both kinds of sound, the divine and human, and also sounds far as well as near. Okay, so what this means that again, based on the fourth jhana or the mastery of the methods in the commentaries, you can develop such a refined capacity for hearing that you can direct the mind to hear the sounds that are taking place in different planes of existence. So here in the human world, if you want to hear conversations taking place far away, you don't have to resort to electronic equipment, but you just make the determination to hear a conversation taking place maybe between maybe some people in France and Germany in Taiwan, in Japan, and you could hear them speaking. Of course, it presupposes that you would have such purity of mind that you wouldn't be wanting to listen in on your friends as they're gossiping about you. But you see this power of the divine air element exercised. There's a short collection of suttas in the Pali Canon called the Udana. And sometimes a conversation is taken. Actually, also one sees that in the Anguttara Nikaya, sometimes a conversation is taking place between two monks, and the Buddha exercises his divine ear element to listen in on the conversation. And then he'll come to the monks later and report that he heard that conversation. And so you can hear things taking place at at a distance here in the human world, but you could also listen to conversations, discussions going on in other realms of existence. In the here, what's mentioned is the divine or heavenly realm. And you could listen also to the sounds of insects, even very, very subtle sounds of insects, and perhaps even the sounds of microscopic organisms. So that is the divine ear element. And then the next one is the ability to know the minds of other beings and persons just by directly turning, adverting one's own mind towards them. And so you can know their state of mind and the text mentions various states of mind. And also you can know their thoughts so this is a capacity for mind reading. Okay, then come, now we come to the three, which are called the three vijas, the three higher knowledges. So one is the ability to recollect one's previous 
is called the past abodes, which in effect means one's past lives. So if one could recollect one birth, two births, even hundreds of past births, thousands, hundreds and thousands, even one's past lives over many aeons, knowing one's name, clan, appearance, the food one ate, one's different experiences, pleasant and painful. And then one knows how one passed away from that life and took rebirth in another life. So this is the capacity for recollecting one's past lives, one's own past lives. And of course, to know one's past lives over such long distant periods requires a very high degree of skill. But what happens even with people who don't have specially highly developed meditative skills, but sometimes there are people who can just spontaneously recollect maybe one past life or sometimes two or three past lives. Yeah, so I've heard of people who develop those abilities. You know, they're not especially skilled meditators, but just through a little sort of casual meditation or just spontaneously, just while, you know, sitting and sort of ruminating, just a recollection of a past life just completely impinges on their consciousness, sometimes in a great deal of detail. Okay, the next one maybe is more difficult. And this is using the divine eye to see beings passing away. This is other beings passing away and taking rebirth in diff under different conditions as inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And then one sees how beings take rebirth in accordance with their karma, that is with their conduct of body, speech, and mind. And so one gets to see how through misconduct or unwholesome karma, one is reborn in bad destinations, and how through wholesome karma, good karma, one takes rebirth and good destinations. And so the five super knowledges that we've just gone through are often called the five mundane or, or worldly higher knowledges, the lokia abhinya. Because these five super knowledges do not necessarily involve some especially keen insight or wisdom. It's said that in the Buddha's time, even before, even those who had the basic delusion or the delusion of a self, the theists who have a belief in an all powerful God, um, those who believe in the Brahman and so forth. In other words, those who hold beliefs or doctrines contrary to the wisdom of the Buddha's teaching could still develop these five super knowledges. But the sixth type of super knowledge, this is the unique, the one that's unique to the Buddha's teaching, and this is called the world transcending or lokutara direct knowledge. And this is the knowledge of the destruction of the asavas. And so when one has mastered the four jhanas, and then of course, one has to go through the process of developing insight. It's not just that you turn your mind to the destruction of the asavas and then boom, the asavas are immediately uprooted. But you first have to couple the mastery over samadhi through the four jhanas or eight attainments, couple that attainment, the attainments of samadhi with the methodical development of insight. And then when you have both insight and samadhi, then you make the determination May my asavas, the root defilements, 
be destroyed, be uprooted, and then may I be able to enter upon the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom, and dwell in it. And then one can do so when there is a suitable basis. So first, let's just raise the question, what are, I, I like the, I don't really like any English rendering for the term. So the Pali word is, Asava, which is translated in various ways. Influx, which means flowing in, but also outflows, um, sometimes intoxicants, corruptions, pollutants, contaminants, many different renderings. Okay, so what exactly are they? The way I understand, first the word was used in India amongst the different school, contemplative schools, even before the time of the Buddha. So it was a word that the Buddha took over from some of the other systems, and it's particularly prominent in the Jain system, where the word asava refers to a kind of corruption that flows into the mind, almost in a material way, into the soul and sort of covers over, materially covers over the soul and prevents it from gaining liberation. So the Buddha took over this term and used it to refer to three and then later four particular qualities or mental states sensual craving, then the craving for continued existence, and ignorance. And then later texts, I think even beginning in the Abhidharma Vitaka, add the asava of wrong views. And so these are the the way I understand it, like these are the these defilements are grouped under this heading because these are the particular defilements most responsible in the strongest sense for sustaining our bondage to samsara, to the cycle of repeated birth and death. So beings, people have the craving for sensual pleasures. And so that craving for sensual pleasures sort of is an attractor that binds us to repeated existence. We have the craving to go on existing under this condition or that condition in this state or that state. And so this becomes an asava. Then of course, ignorance, not understanding the nature of things is really at the basis of sensual craving and craving for continued existence. And then the later texts add wrong views because often it is wrong view that sustains sensual craving and craving for existence. One could have the wrong view that this is the only life we live after death. At death, everything is abolished, eliminated. And so we might as well enjoy, enjoy as many sensual pleasures as we can here and now. So in this way, one wrong view supports sensual craving, or one could have the wrong view that there is some kind of eternal self or soul, which abides forever. And that view will support the craving for continued existence. So wrong view is a kind of outcrop of ignorance and wrong view reinforces both sensual craving and craving for continued existence. Yeah, sometimes you might raise the question, some people might raise the question, what about the three bad roots that are spoken about? So the three bad roots we know 
or greed, hatred, and delusion. Okay, so relating the three bad roots to the asavas, we have under the heading of greed, we would include sensual craving and craving for existence. Even though in English, the word greed maybe has too narrow, uh, maybe the nuance is a bit too narrow in that greed usually suggests particularly greed for wealth, for money. If somebody wants to, you know, to just accumulate money and hold on to their wealth without sharing with others. So that is the nuance, the connotation of greed in English. But in Pali, I guess loba can have, or raga can have a broader meaning, including sensual craving and craving for continued existence. Then delusion or moha is pretty much equivalent. It's just another term set for, almost synonymous with ignorance. And so you might raise the question, why is hatred not included amongst the asavas? And I haven't seen that question raised and answered in any of the classical texts, but my understanding is that hatred in itself is not, doesn't have a positive role in binding us to the cycle of repeated birth and death. Hatred more, the function of hatred, or let's say the role of hatred is to generate strong, negative or unwholesome karma. But hatred has the nature of sort of turning away or the impulse to negate and destroy or to turn away from fear or from aversion. Whereas greed has the its direction, its vector, so to speak, is to grasp on and hold tightly. So greed can be equivalent to two of the asavas. And delusion has the function of covering up, obscuring, the same as the function of ignorance. And that covering up or obscuring provides the room, the territory, the scope for sensual craving and craving for existence to operate. Okay, so those are my interpretation. That's my interpretation of why certain factors are included as asavas, but hatred is excluded. Okay, maybe before we go further, maybe we could see if there's any questions. I have to look at the participant list. Yeah, so if you, you know how to raise questions. Okay, so we'll start off with Gita. Did you have questions? Thank you, Bhante, for teaching us. Wonderful, thank you. Bhante, I have a question for you about the Idipada. So in order for one to end the cycle of suffering, we don't need the Idipada powers, right? Because in the Buddha's time, there were many Bhantes or many venerables that awakened without the Idipada. Like Sariputta himself didn't have Idipada yeah, like Mokalana. Yeah. yeah. Right? So it's just that we need to penetrate the super mundane states and realize, right, the ending of suffering to cut off the cycle understanding the Paticca Samrupada and developing the seven factors of enlightenment and so on, right? Yeah, that's very, very good. Very important point, actually. Yeah, even though the sutta, the sutta mentions these, these five mundane abhinyas and other suttas mention them, and the Buddha and some of the foremost disciples had them, but they are not in any way essential for liberation. So the one that's essential, in fact, that's equivalent to liberation is the sixth one. But the sixth one does not depend upon the other five. And even as Gita just mentioned, yeah, it's interesting. There's a bit of a contradiction here between the commentaries and the sutta. 
where the commentaries, because I don't think that the commentaries want to say that Sariputta didn't have the <laughs> Abhinyas, so they ascribe the Abhinyas, the, these super knowledges to Sariputta too. But there are some verses in the Teragata where Sariputta said that I didn't have any inclination of mind I mean, I can't take care of yeah. to the Abhinyas. <laughs> Yeah, please, somebody, somebody is unmuted. Yeah, please mute yourself. Okay, we'll take the next is Marcel. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, thank you. There was a, an important point that I should have mentioned that I overlooked. Okay, Marcel. Uh, thanks, Bhante, for taking my question. I'd like to revisit the psychic power, particularly the line that says, may I appear and vanish, may I go unhindered through a wall, etc. Yeah. And there's a line that says, may I exercise mastery with the body. So if we were to take this psychic power literally, doesn't it imply the mastery of form, which in turn would imply form is worthy to be considered as self and thus at odds with Samyutta Nikaya 22, 59, which yeah. says, uh, because form is non-self, form leads to affliction, and it is possible yeah. to have it of form. Let my form be thus. Let my form not be thus. Is there a way to reconcile these two? Yeah, us? they're not really in contradiction. When it's said in that, that's the discourse on the non-self characteristic, in which the Buddha says it's impossible to have mastery over rupa, over the bodily form, such that one could determine, let my body be thus, let my body not be thus. That is in this, what's implied there is a kind of absolute or unconditioned mastery over bodily form, such that you can make the determination, may I not grow, especially I think what's intended, may I not grow old, but remain young forever. May I not fall ill, but may I always remain healthy. May I not die, but may I live, um, live forever. But what's meant here is, even though, yeah, the expression is the same, but what is meant here basically is that you're able to travel bodily up into one is able to travel bodily to other realms of existence, even to the Brahma world. Yeah, that is the intention. Yeah, yeah, that's all, yeah. So, so the psychic power has the limitations that we cannot prevent uh, or transform our body to be beautiful or to become less old. So there's some limitations to that. Is yeah, one, yeah. Though so even if you remember the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, again, there's some question about whether this passage is authentic or not, but there's this famous scene in the Buddha's la the, the last year of the Buddha's life where he turns to Ananda and he says that if one has gained mastery over the four Idipadas, the four roads of psychic power. If one wanted to live to the end of the aeon, one would be able to do so. And so the Buddha was implying there that if Ananda requested him to live on to the end of the aeon, he would be able to do so. But even if one could live on to the end of the aeon, the end of the cosmic aeon, still the aeon would come to an end and one would have to die at the end of the aeon. Yeah, so with um, by mastering the basis for psychic power, one could have a great deal of mastery over the body, but not an absolute mastery over the body. One still has to grow old, fall sick and die. And one has other limitations as well. Okay, next we take Yudi. 
Yeah. Yes, hello, Bante. So um, you have to you get closer to your microphone. Okay, can you hear me? I could hear you, but the voice is a bit faint. Okay, Try now? Again. Oh yeah, much, much better, yeah. Okay, so uh, in following up to the, the, the previous question, um, I was wondering um, if, if you read in the suttas whether um, the Buddha is, uh, actually is able to, uh, besides becoming one, um, can he also appear like in different forms? Like, you know, it's, it's like in, Instead of a Buddha, can he appear like a, as a different form, like as another? Um... I see to take a, to appear as, instead of appearing as a Buddha, but appearing in different. Yes, yeah. in a different form. Yeah, interestingly, there is one passage like that. I th can think of only one such passage, which occurs in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Um, let me see if I could quickly find it because it's an interesting passage. Okay. Yeah. Do you see the text called Eight Assemblies? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is the passage that I had in mind. So he it starts off that the Buddha is talking to Anandi. He says that there are these eight kinds of assemblies of nobles, Brahmins, householders, ascetics, and so on. Then he says, I recall how I have attended each of these eight kinds of assemblies, even hundreds of times. And then before I sat down and started speaking with them, I made my appearance resemble theirs, my voice resemble theirs. And so I taught them the Dharma and I aroused them, edified and gladdened them. And yet while I was speaking to them thus, they didn't know me. And then they would ask one another, who is he that speaks thus? Is it a man or a God? And then having taught them, then I would straight away vanish. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I think this is the only passage that I've seen like this. And it seems very similar, I have to say, <laughs> to the idea that appears in Mahayana Buddhism. Yes. Of, yeah, of the bodhisattvas, particularly uh, Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin in the Universal Gate chapter of the Lotus Sutra, where it said that whatever form is necessary to be able to communicate with beings, Guan Yin will take on that form if a person is to be converted or transformed by a Brahmin, Guan Yin will appear as a Brahmin. If it's by a warrior, she'll appear in the form of a warrior. If it's a noble, in the form of a noble. If it's a ordinary householder, she'll appear as a householder. If it's a monk, she'll appear as a monk. If it's a nun, she'll appear as a nun. If it's a god, she'll appear as a god, and so on. Yes, but this is the only, offhand, this is the only passage in the Nikayas that has that, in which the Buddha says that he takes on these different appearances. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Okay, I want to continue now. We could close this up. Yeah, because there are some other suttas that we came across when we did the Book of Threes, which also use the simile of 
um, refining gold to illustrate the process of mental cultivation of purification. So it will be maybe helpful. Actually, there are two suttas like that back to back. Okay, so one of them is um, Book of Threes, Sutta number. One, 101 called the soil remover. So this one speaks of first gross defilements of gold. This is not other metals that form alloy, alloys with gold, but these are you know, other substances that get mixed in with the raw gold ore. So here we have soil, grit, and gravel. And so now we have the soil remover or would actually be a, a, yeah, this is one who has, I guess that there are different workers with different tasks in the process of purifying gold. So this one is called the soil remover. So he first pours the gold into a trowel and then washes, rinses, and cleans it. And so he removes these gross defilements, but then there still remain middle-sized defilements of the gold fine grit and coarse sand. Then he washes the gold and removes these middle-sized defilements or corruptions. And then there still remain subtle defilements in the gold, very fine sand and black dust. And then the soil remover removes those fine or subtle defilements of gold. And then when he has removed them, then only grains of gold remain. I guess then he passes the grains of gold onto the goldsmith. And then the goldsmith pours the melt the gold into a melting pot or puts the gold into a melting pot and then melts it, fans it, or fans it, melts it, and smelts it. And even when he does this, still the gold is not yet settled and the dross has not yet been entirely removed. And so the gold is not yet malleable, wieldy, and luminous, but it still tends to be brittle and not properly fit for work. But now the goldsmith um, removes that dross from the gold. So now the gold becomes malleable, wieldy, and luminous pliant and properly fit for work. And then the goldsmith can use the gold to make whatever ornament he wants, a bracelet, earrings, necklace, garland, and so on. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to apply this to the stages in the refinement of the mind. So here we have a monk or any practitioner devoted to the adhichita, the higher mind. And so first we have gross defilements. So this would be misconduct or transgressions of body, speech, and mind. And so one removes those by regulating one's bodily and verbal conduct by restraining the mind. But still there crop up these middle, medium-sized defilements. These would be the three types of wrong thoughts sensual thoughts, thoughts of anger, aversion, or ill will, and then thoughts of harming, of injury, or cruelty. And then the earnest practitioner abandons and removes those. And then there remain the subtle defilements. And these are thoughts about one's relatives, thoughts about one's country or one's hometown, one's neighborhood, and so on. Thoughts of, and then thoughts about one's reputation, thoughts about wanting respect from others, admiration from others, um, and so forth. And then the practitioner, in this case, abandons, dispels, removes those kinds of thoughts. And then the text says that when this has been done, then there remains the Pali expression used is Dhamma Vitaka. And the meaning is not exactly transparent. 
So let's see what the commentary says. I think I have a note from the commentary. So the commentary closes these as thoughts connected with the 10 corruptions of insight. But I don't agree with the commentary here because the practitioner here is not involved in the development of insight, but developing samadhi. But then I conjectured in the note, this could perhaps means reflections on the Dhamma or reflections on the meditation subject. But again, I'm not sure that that is the meaning because now the way I would take this, that this is a vitaka, it could be the vitaka present in the first jhana. Because the first jhana, of course, it's a state of samadhi, of concentration. But even in the first jhana, because vitaka and vichara, what I translate as thought and examination, are a present. So the mind, the concentration is really not completely peaceful and sublime and not attained to full tranquility, not yet attained to complete unification, but there's still some effort involved in suppressing and restraining the defiled thoughts, even in the first jhana. So then the text says, there comes a time when the mind becomes internally steady, composed, unified, and concentrated. And this I take to be my conjecture that this would be the attainment of the fourth jhana, the fourth stage of absorption. In that stage, the concentration is peaceful and sublime gained by full tranquilization and attained to unification. So now it's not checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. And so then it continues. So if there's a suitable basis, then one is capable of realizing any state realizable by direct knowledge. And then it goes on to these six super knowledges. Yeah, what I like about this sutta is that instead of using the five hindrances as sort of the subject of discussion in the purification of the mind, it uses the different types of thoughts that can arise. So particularly, I mean, this is something we could relate to quite easily. The, arising of sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, maybe for most of us, not thoughts of harming, but particularly sensual thoughts and thoughts of ill will, which correspond to the first two hindrances, the hindrance of sensual desire and the hindrance of ill will. But then beyond that, it introduces these subtler kinds of distracting thoughts. And maybe these are just examples, thoughts about one's relatives. How's my mother doing? How's my father doing? How are my brothers and sisters, sons and daughters? And so on, thoughts about my neighborhood, what's going on in my neighborhood? And thoughts about one's reputation, of course, am I respected? Do people treat me well? So these are things we could relate to quite readily, at least I can. Okay, and then there's another sutta concerned with the simile of refining gold. And so this one says that the monk who's devoted to the higher mind should give attention. The sutta uses the expression three nimitas, but here the word nimita doesn't have the same meaning as it, it, the word acquires in the Visuddhi Magga where it means a kind of luminous object, a visualized object of meditation, but rather it seems here to mean something like three approaches that one should take. And so it says from time to time, one, sh one should give attention to the mark of concentration 
from time to time to the mark of exertion, from time to time to the mark of equanimity. So the three Pali words are samadhi, and exertion is pagaha, which implies virya or energy. And then equanimity is upeka. And then the text explains that to gain the kind of samadhi necessary, one has to be able to skillfully apply whichever of these three qualities are necessary, depending on one's condi the condition of one's mind, depending on the circumstances. Okay, so it says, so if one ex attends exclusively to the mark of concentration, that is, it, then it becomes possible that the mind will tend towards laziness. If one attends exclusively to the mark of exertion, so if one continually pushes and strives and exerts oneself, then the mind might incline towards restlessness. And if one attends exclusively to the quality of equanimity, then it's still possible that the mind will not be properly concentrated for the destruction of the asavas. So generally it's said that what one has to, the kind of skill one has to develop is to balance concentration and energy. And when you balance concentration and energy, then you can look on with equanimity. So it seems that of the three, the one that's sort of the gateway to the proper concentration for the destruction of the taints is equanimity. But it seems that if one, what happens if you just attend exclusively to equanimity from time to time, it seems, it seems to me that then concentration starts to become more prominent in a way that leads towards laziness. And in that case, to dispel the laziness, one has to use exertion to exert the mind. But then if you continue to exert the mind, then the mind will tend towards restlessness. And so the skillful way is from time to time when necessary, one focuses on concentrating the mind. And then if the mind is, tends to become stagnant through con too much concentration, then you have to exert the mind. And when you exert the mind and bring it back to concentration, then it will slide into equanimity. And then keeping the mind in that equanimity without letting it become stagnant, then the mind becomes malleable, wieldy and luminous, pliant and concentrated for the destruction of the asavas. And then we have the simile of the goldsmith, again, refining gold. And so and it's remarkable that the Buddha seems to know in quite in quite a detailed way how a goldsmith goes about refining gold. So the goldsmith takes some gold with the tongs and puts the gold into a crucible. And then from time to time, he would blow on it with a fan. From time to time, sprinkle water over it. And then from time to time, just look on. Now, if the goldsmith just blows on the gold with the fan, repeatedly fanning the gold, then the gold would get too hot and would melt and burn up. But if he just, when the gold is, gets very hot, if he just sprinkles water on the gold, keeps on sprinkling gold, then the gold will cool down so it doesn't melt and is not fit for making ornaments. So it just cools down. And then if he just exclusively looks on from it without taking any further action, then it's possible that the gold would not reach the right consistency. 
So from to get it to the right consistency from time to time, he has to make some exertion. Some from time to time, he has to apply. Uh, from time to time, he has to use the fan to get it to heat it. When it's starting to get too hot, he has to use the water to cool it down. And so he revolves, cycles through these three stages till the gold reaches that right degree of consistency. And then the gold becomes malleable, wieldy, and luminous, fit for work. And the goldsmith can then make whatever ornament he wishes to make with it. And so again, the text repeats the same thing about the, the monk refining the mind. And then when the mind is properly refined, then one can use the mind to develop these six types of super knowledge culminating in the destruction of the asavas. Okay, so that takes us to the end of the material I wanted to cover. So again, if there's any any questions, again, you could use your hand symbol. And Yuti, did you have another question? Uh, no, no about them, okay. Okay, I think the hand was just then raised from Oh, Austin. okay, thank you. Okay, Marcel, did you have a new question? Yes, Bande, thanks for taking my okay. questioning. Just a quick one, since Bande brought up uh, Mahaparini Banasuta, Diga Nikaya 16, I recall, but there are three books on Diga Nikaya by Bante, Diga Nikaya 1, 2, and 15. Is there a book by Bante on Diga Nikaya 16 as well? No, I didn't, trans I didn't translate the Diga Nikaya because when I was at the Buddhist Publication Society, we, had, we published what I considered quite a good translation. It was done by a German nun and then refined by a, an Englishman living in Sri Lanka. Uh, okay, thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Okay, any further questions? Okay, I don't see any, any questions and I think then we'll... <clears throat> We'll have to end, but before we end, I want to mention that over the Labor Day weekend, that's from Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, we're having a four-day retreat on contemplation of the body, and we might need at least one or maybe even two more people to volunteer to work the Zoom, um, the Zoom account behind the scenes. And if anybody has any experience using Zoom and would like to volunteer, you could use the chat box. Please put your name and your email address. And I will turn it over to Kaidi, who is sort of coordinating the volunteers. It doesn't take much skill. Basically what you would have to do is know how to spotlight the speaker and basically how to run the Zoom program, when to pause it, when to stop it. And I think not much more than that. So if you would like to volunteer, please just again, put your name and email address in the chat box. Then I will pick, it, pick, the, pick that up when I come back from lunch. And if you've had any experience using the Zoom, mention that too, so we know who has experience with the Zoom program. Okay, so let me end with the sharing of the merits. So I'll recite the verses for sharing the merits. And particularly, I want to share the merits with the people of Myanmar, who are really going through a very difficult time right now, even Sad to say, but the government has been just rounding up the pro-democracy activists, accusing them of being terrorists and then executing. They've already executed four, and I think they have about 40 lined up for execution. Akasata Jabumata Deva Naga Mahidika 
punyantang anumodipa chirang rakantu sasana asasata jabumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumodipa chirang rakantu desanang akasata jabumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumodipa chirang rakantu mang parang Dukha pata chani dukha, baya pata chani baya, soka pata chani soka, antu sabepi hanino. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. Yes, I all, I just remembered, but I should have also mentioned that the Anyone who volunteers to help run the Zoom during the retreat should be somebody living in North America. So that we have you basically, at least within our own time zones. If you're in Malaysia or Singapore, you might be <laughs> awake at the time when all of us are asleep. So ideally, it should be those either, I guess in the West Coast is okay, but preferably in the East Coast. But if you're on the West Coast and want to volunteer, you can still do so. We could fit you in on time slots when we'll be active. Okay, so I'm going to end the program now and thank you all for joining. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Be safe, Bante. Take care. Okay, take care. Thank you so much for taking. Thank you. 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 Thank you.